Hello, everyone. It's Jamal Thomas. Welcome to the Progressive Soapbox. Guys, I have with me an awesome guest and an awesome interview for today. Let's get that part. An awesome interview for today. Um, I have Margaret Kimberly, editor and senior columnist of the Black Agenda Report and committee member for Black Agenda for Peace. Margaret, please say hello to the audience. Hello, and thank you so much. It's Black uh, Alliance for Peace. Black Alliance for Peace. Did, did I say that right? <laughs> you oh. do what I do. I often confuse agenda and alliance. Yes, but Black Alliance for Peace. Ah, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so you're here with me. I'm just checking my levels to make sure the value and everything else is good. Perfect. So I was contacted by um, um, a, a member of Black Alliance for peace. Am I saying that right? Uh, Black Alliance for Peace, right? Yes, BAP. You can say BAP for sure. Okay, BAP's for sure. Um, about a, an initiative that you guys were starting mm -hmm. called Get Out of Africa, essentially get the United States out of Africa. Yes. Before we get to that point, I kind of want to step through just to establish a, a few things. Um, now, what is BAP? I guess BAP works on both ends, but what is um, the organization? Black Alliance for Peace was uh, founded on April 4th, uh, 2017. And uh, that date is a very significant one. Uh, that was the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's speech at the Riverside Church in New York City, where he broke with the Johnson administration on the issue of the Vietnam War. Yes. Um, and it, exactly one year later, 1968, was the date of his assassination. And he was assassinated, I believe, and others in large part because he had taken this uh, anti-war stance. Uh, in the face of terrible criticism, everybody loves him now. Yeah. Uh, he was vilified by the New York Times, by the Washington Post, by the networks, by some people in the SCLC, including his own father and friends who said, this is not the time. Johnson is our friend. You, you know, you don't want to tick him off. But he courageously did the right thing and was consistently anti-war from that day forward. Uh, and so that date was chosen uh, for the founding of Black Alliance for Peace. We are a people-centered, Black-led movement. Uh, we believe that it is very important to recapture that uh, um, anti-war polity that until fairly recently, that was always consistent among our people. Black people have always been the most anti-war, the most left-leaning, um, but the Democratic Party has gone to the right, Obama being president moved us further to the right, but Black Alliance for Peace is committed to uh, reestablishing that uh, position that we have always had. And uh, we began uh, last year in October, I can't believe I'm saying last year already, even though it was a few months ago. Uh, <laughs> October 1st, we began our um, campaign to uh, end AFRICOM and get the United States out of the African con continent and end uh, US uh, uh, military role in any African nation. I'm glad you mentioned the Martin Luther King thing. Um, like you said, people try to associate themselves with this behavior now, like, oh, we love King, they hug him like nobody's business. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that wasn't, when Martin Luther King stepped out of the Vietnam, people were like, why is this Negro talking about um, these war issues? He's supposed to be dealing with the issues of blacks in America. Um, what was King's reasoning for this? I, I, I mean, I'm doing an interview and people always chide me that, you know, you never let your interview person on your interview talk. What was his reason for this? And was this um, necessary to understand now? Meaning um, the reason why King stepped out from the standpoint of war and how he connected the issues of war and imperialism abroad to the subjugation of African-Americans here in the United States. Well, part of it was um, just uh, very practical and obvious. You cannot spend a lot of money on the military and take care of your people. Uh, the needs of people in this country cannot be met. Uh, today, uh, the uh, defense budget, is, it's 60% of the budget. 
Yeah. So any talk of, uh, and, and this is something that um, uh, is a critique of Bernie Sanders and others who they may have domestic policies that we are in favor of and want to see enacted, but you cannot have Medicare for all, you can't have free college, you can't build the infrastructure, uh, you can't give money to public education, you can't do anything to help people as long as the budget, uh, the military sucks up so much of our money. Uh, and King knew this. He could not say that the government should do more for its people, that we ought to have a democratic society if you always also had uh, this war on the other side of the world, which sucked up millions of dollars. Um, he was also a person, <clears throat> excuse me, he was always an internationalist. He was also always someone who uh, worked for uh, the care of humanity and warfare is uh, the exact opposite. Uh, we're talking yeah. about uh, uh, terrorism. Uh, he said the United States was the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. And here we are 50 years later, and it's still true. So um, he, he said he couldn't care about people in this country, but be indifferent to the plight of people in Vietnam who only wanted to be able to practice self-determination and choose the government that they wanted. That was all they wanted. And for the United States to claim a right to invade their country and kill millions of people was wrong. And he said as much, very clearly. Yeah. Yeah, it's there's a conversation between McNamara um, and I think it's what you meant just before he make it pass. And McNamara was shocked to find out that um, they just wanted self determination. Like you know, the United States coded as if it was this communist takeover of Vietnam, and it wasn't it in the least. They just wanted you know the ability to choose their own government in this sense, um, making this point that you know if liberal democracy allowed France to take over our country that we don't necessarily want liberal democracy. It was the example that they set, which was the thing that showed, you know, pushed them in a different direction. I, yeah, I, that, that's, I, that always blew me away to hear that speech for King um, in Vietnam um, at a time where African Americans were finally making inroads into a political process. Um, and he was able to make the, 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 make the, 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 I guess the connection between those things and still having the moral for order to, to be able to back away from it and go after him um, for this kind of war policy. I, I love that speech. That is yeah, yeah. Um, so what is AFRICOM? Explain AFRICOM. AFRICOM is the US Africa Command. Uh, uh, unbeknownst to most people, the United States has uh, taken it upon itself to divide up the world into various commands. There's a NORTHCOM and a SOUTHCOM. And on October 1st, 2008, and uh, the last few months of George W. Bush's administration, they created AFRICOM, the US Africa Command, which is actually headquartered in Germany, which tells you how popular the idea was, still is in Stuttgart, Germany. Um, and, since, and in that time, mostly of obviously during the Obama administration and continuing into the Trump administration, uh, the United States has, has quite literally taken over the militaries of most African countries. There are only two countries on the continent that uh, do not have a connection with AFRICOM. So there are U.S. troops on the ground in many countries. We found out in Niger when those four yeah. soldiers were killed at, uh, towards the end of 2017. There are drone bases in Africa. So you have a, a, a new kind of colonialism where African countries cannot, obviously, as we were just talking about self-determination, uh, people in these nations can't do what they want if they have military uh, control of their countries by the United States. And uh, uh, officers in, in these various nations are, are trained by the US, and there's also a military presence. And this is very dangerous for um, uh, African people who uh, still struggle to find true independence. Decades after their countries became nominally independent from uh, uh, European colonial nations, mostly uh, Britain and, and France, but others as well, Portugal. And um, 
uh, but they're not independent. They cannot be independent if they have, are under the military control of the US. And that means the US gets to do what it wants to do and uh, have control of African resources, have control of African uh, politics. So, uh, so that is a, a short description of what AFRICOM is. You know, when I was in Kenya, I was in two African nations, Kenya and Egypt, on the last, the last trip. Um, one of the gentlemen that I ended up interviewing kind of made it very clear that his friends, who was trained by U.S. soldiers, Kenyan, he said um, they were trained by U.S. soldiers. He said there's a African, um, a U.S. African base um, or recruitment center. He says I can take you there. Um, he says I have pictures of him essentially being in conflict with U.S. soldiers and training with U.S. soldiers. And I, I'm floored by this. Like, I, I, I didn't, I knew that the United States was in the various African nations. I didn't know how integrated the United States was with those nations. Um, he made this point that he says, my friend was doing very grisly things. He said, the people who are getting in knowing that they're doing grisly things, he said the poverty in those countries propel people to be willing to accept accept um, that military role. It's like, if you need to feed your family, you need to feed your family. What are you going to do? Let your kids starve? Or are you going to do something grisly in order to feed them? Sure. Um, and, you know, this wasn't something that he necessarily liked. Like, like, this wasn't a popular position. In fact, it was so unpopular that it was causing political upheaval in the country itself. Um, I, I was amazed by this. Like, like I, I don't think most Americans know how integrated the United States is into the various uh, militaries of the nations around the world. Oh, sure. Well, the United States has military bases and other facilities in um, uh, more than 100 countries. The, depending on how you count these facilities, it's somewhere between 800 and 1,000 uh, bases and, and various facilities that the U.S. has around the world. So Africa is actually a small piece of a bigger, a bigger puzzle of uh, U.S. efforts to literally control as much of the world as it possibly can. Yeah. And uh, it's something that is not discussed enough, but there are uh, groups, Afri <clears throat> excuse me, Black Alliance for Peace is one of many groups were part of a larger coalition. Um, uh, and there was a recent international conference in uh, in Dublin, which I was fortunate enough to attend, uh, international conference against U.S. NATO military bases. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, NATO is a bigger part of this puzzle. It's not just the United States, but it's uh, NATO partners uh, <clears throat> who have these facilities all over the world and uh, therefore restrict the rights to self-determination of all these uh, countries. And, you know, in, com in comparison, Russia has uh, bases in uh, outside of Russia in only nine countries. Yeah. That's it. So more than 109. So we can see who's uh, really practicing uh, imperialism. And that's a, wor a word that people think of as being old fashioned, but it should not be. That's exactly what we're talking about. Uh, if you have military control and military bases, you control what people can and cannot do and what they can and cannot uh, even talk about or vote for. So uh, Black Alliance for Peace is uh, we're, we're happy to be part of these larger coalitions uh, who uh, fight against these, uh, these same forces. Now, the organization or the initiative that's being put out, this United States Out of Africa, um, what are the objectives? What are the, I, I know the basic objective is, you know, get out, leave Africa to its own devices. Um, but there were specific demands. Mm -hmm. What were the demands that were associated with the organization? Well, people can see, we have a, uh, a petition and you can find, I'll look at my t-shirt. The link's at the bottom. I have the link at the bottom of the video. Okay. Tinyurl.com slash shutdown Africom. Uh, our petition is in six different languages, English, French, Spanish, German, Vietnamese, and <laughs> Arabic. I think I got all six. And it's, it's a very clear statement that the U.S. should get out of Africa. 
Um, we're also making a demand specifically to the Congressional Black Caucus uh, to take the lead on this issue, to hold hearings. And as we're, everyone's bragging about the Democrats uh, now uh, having control of the House of Representatives, let's see uh, what that really means. So uh, we are calling on uh, the CBC to hold hearings, to take the lead in making this demand that the uh, U.S. leave Africa. And uh, it's part of, the connection is larger. Um, uh, your viewers may know about the 1033 program, which brings uh, uh, spare uh, U.S. Um, Defense Department equipment and gives it to police departments. Yeah. That's insane. That's it's utterly insane. insane. You would have these little towns um, with tanks. <laughs> it's yes. Like, yes, absolutely. And unfortunately, most CBC members voted to expand this program. And it expanded the most when uh, Obama was president. We want an end to the 1033 program. We want an end to AFRICOM. And we need to have a larger discussion uh, about uh, the role of the US abroad, uh, about our ex, uh, tacit acceptance uh, of this and what it does to us here. And as King told us 50 years ago, we cannot have a truly democratic country when our uh, nation practices imperialism. We will end up with uh, military vehicles uh, in uh, Podunk, USA. Yeah. We will end up with death across the world. We will end up with a... Um, uh, the military sucking uh, all the money out of the budget and crumbling infrastructure and crumbling uh, schools and uh, uh, people in debt and, and no health care, so on and so on. All of these things, all of our needs could be taken care of if we didn't have this huge military budget. The, there's enough money in the treasury to take care of all the human needs that people have in this country, but we cannot talk about wanting those things if we do not also talk about international issues, if we do not also talk about AFRICOM and other means of the United States practicing imperialism abroad. We cannot have a real democracy. We cannot have uh, uh, people who have an expect, we can't have an expectation uh, that our needs will be met if we also accept this bloated military budget. And by the way, Trump asked for a 10% increase in the military budget, a number he pulled out of thin air. And <laughs> Democrats gave him more than what he asked for. Um, you know, the, the US military budget totals that of the next, of the six or seven other countries. It's even yes, yeah, yeah. China and France and UK and Russia and uh, Saudi Arabia. If you combine all of their military budgets, it equals that of, uh, of the US. So, um, you know, people say that, um, as, as you pointed out, many of the, the criticisms of King was, you know, why is he talking about stuff uh, outside of this country? We have to talk about things outside of the country because though that determines what can and can't be done inside the country. You know, we could cut our military budget in half and still be twice as much as the next largest country. Yes. Like, like, like it's, it's obscene. Um, two items. Mm -hmm. So the first one has to do with, um, oh, geez, it, it slipped from my mind as soon as I this said it. Um, so well, I'll move to the second item. The first item will come back up. China. Yes. Now, when I was uh, when I was over there, one of the things that kept coming up was China. It was everywhere, even in the casinos. You see Chinese <laughs> you know, gambling, like hardcore gamblers um, in the casinos. But the casinos, some of them, um, adjusted itself in order to make a habitable space for them. Now, I bring this up because it gives you this influence of China in the African region. Um, there were even newspapers that kind of made this point of, um, with the imperialism of Europe, they left us in a vulnerable state for Chinese to essentially in, in, ingratiate itself economically into the country. You can't be there without seeing the influence of China and Africa. It is an amazing thing. Um, Part of, I would argue, that this AFRICOM thing, it's not just, um, you're right, imperialism, it, but it goes, oh, I know what it was. It's darker than, than what you're saying. So yes, the military budget takes up almost half of our discretionary spending, but 
It gets worse than that because it's like, how do you have a democracy when the overwhelming majority of the budget is black? Meaning, you know, when they looked at, you know, it just says this thing to a random office, but the actual amount that these random offices are spending is somewhat unknown. What they're spending it on is unknown. You only have a very few members of Congress that are even privy to what these black budget stuff is. Like, it's darker than that. Uh, in Chalmers Johnson's book, I think it was Blowback, he makes that point pretty clearly where he goes through the expenditures and he realizes, you know, you don't know what these are. Like, you know, these kind of um, go into departments and there's this kind of weird quasi government private thing, but the public itself and even the, most of the congressional members don't know. Like, I, I find that to be a fascinating thing. How do you have a democracy when you can't even, you know, vote on those issues? Right. Well, they, you know, wasn't it recently revealed that there was a trillion dollars missing from the defense department that's unaccounted for? Nobody knows how it was spent or, or where it went. I mean, uh, that's absolutely disgraceful. But if you'd ever talk about doing anything that helps people, what's the first thing you hear? How, how do you pay, pay for it? How, how do you pay for that? that? You can't pay for free college. You can't pay for uh, you can't pay for anything that helps people. Meanwhile, there's a trillion dollars uh, that's Nobody knows where it went. So yeah. it is inherently undemocratic. Uh, and uh, it will only get worse if, uh, if we don't speak to it. And, if, and as the 2020 presidential election has already started, um, Elizabeth yeah. Warren was the first to uh, make the official announcement. And she's one of these people with a liberal reputation, but she's not willing to talk about um, uh, what the military budget does uh, to people yeah. and how it hamstrings the government and, and uh, um, basically makes a determination that you're not getting anything you need. If we're going to have a, you know, the military taking up that much money, you're not getting anything you need. So it's, uh, it's pie in the sky. So if you really want it, you have to also talk about military spending and the U.S. bases in uh, Africa and uh, around the world. You know, part of the problem is that the military has become a jobs program. If um, congressional members want to end military spending, that may mean closing a base in their particular district. I, I live here in, in Richmond. Um, Norfolk is like a major military base. Mm -hmm. if, um, if you're talking about closing, if cutting the military budget in half, um, what's going to happen to those jobs? And I suspect that part of the, the logistics that congressional members come up, yeah, it's a gross way of trying to create, you know, jobs and everything else. And that money is going into people's pockets. I would say it's only being filtered down to other people who work in those areas. Um, but congressional members have to deal with that. I, I think that's that's pro part of the logic that some of these members go with, missing the point that you can invest that money at home and still get that same benefit of a jobs boost. I mean, it's, it's we could create different jobs. Yeah. I, who says the jobs have to be in, in the military? Oh, I agree. But, I agree. Uh, you know, we, we are, we are told this constantly. There's always some reason why you can't uh, touch the military budget. Yeah. People will lose jobs. Of course, you could create jobs somewhere else. But uh, these uh, defense contractors, uh, they lobby con Congress constantly. Yes. I was in Washington briefly this past weekend and it's very strange to see these advertisements in the metro system for Raytheon and for Boeing and uh, uh, this uh, propaganda. There's no other word for it. Yeah, says that uh, the business of America is war. So you have uh, these um, defense contractors making billions of dollars, and, um, pretending to be the the sole source of employment in the country. Yeah, also called in the U.S. military, I, I believe, is the biggest polluter in the world. And it's obvious. You, you can't have aircraft carriers and military bases and, and not uh, um, use a lot of fossil fuels and dispose of, of uh, fossil fuels. And, but, these, uh, but that is excluded, by the way, from these um, uh, climate agreements, these, these climate accords. They exclude they have these uh, uh, goals of reducing fossil fuel usage, but it excludes the military, which yeah. makes it pretty farcical, one of many reasons that, that they are. But, but I also want to get back to Africa. Yes. Um, 
because since we began our U.S. Out of Africa campaign on October 1st, uh, John Bolton, the national security advisor, um, gave a speech on, in December of just a few weeks ago about China. <coughs> Excuse me. And basically, he warned African countries to end their, um, their um, relations with, with China. Yeah, now, right. you point out, uh, China has mo China has more money than it can spend. Apparently, I, I think that's a <laughs> way of describing it. And China has moved into Africa. They the relationships are their positives and negatives. Um, Chinese companies make a lot of money. They insist that their companies move into Africa. Sometimes their people are employed instead of local people. So there are problems involved with it. But they are also forgiving debt, unlike the IMF, unlike the World Bank, which insist on austerity for African countries in order to get any help. China has uh, uh, helped out many African economies in that way. They are building roads, building bridges, uh, building train railroad systems. And uh, uh, I, I would say it's a net benefit, frankly. And of course, the U.S. realizes this. So Bolton gives this speech at the Heritage Foundation and warns uh, China to stay out of Africa and says that uh, you Africans don't know what you're doing. And this help from China comes with strings attached. And uh, uh, the United States will help you, but you got to do what we want. I mean, it's just a, it was just absurd. But at the same time, it uh, shows us um, uh, how the United States sees the rest of the world. China is a competitor. Um, China uh, is set to become the world's largest economy. And by um, moving into Africa um, uh, economically will, of course, be a rival politically for the United States. And, and that was the impetus for this, uh, this uh, bizarre um, speech which um, uh, imply that Africans don't know what they're doing and aren't smart enough to know uh, who their, their friends are. But, uh, and there's a statement on the Black Alliance for Peace uh, website about, uh, about Bolton's uh, uh, speech. So it tells you why AFRICOM needs to end. Um, the US has nothing to offer Africa except more militarism, which is the last thing African countries need is more war more death. Uh, and the same thing happens to their countries. If they are spending money on their militaries, they're not taking care of the needs of their people. Um, they cannot practice self-determination if you have governments that are um, under the military control of the United States. So uh, we can see why uh, Bolton felt the need to, uh, to make this statement, but it also reaffirms our commitment for the U.S. to get out of Africa. Yeah, it's disturbing. I mean, <clears throat> there's an odd, um, like you said, quasi-military economic thing that's going on where, like you said, China has started to ingratiate itself into Africa um, and the United States with military might in Africa take steps in order to try to hedge off the fact that China is, you know, going in economically. Um, yeah, that's an odd way. I, I remember one of the things that came up when I was over there was talking about a military base that China was going to open in Africa. Now, a military base makes all the sense of the world from a logical standpoint. You want to protect the, you know, your, your economic gains within the country itself. Um, the, the catch with this is it puts you head to head with the United States military that is also in that country. Um, yeah, what's taking place in Africa is fascinating right now. Um, and I totally uh, get and agree with the aims of, look, you, you've instantiated yourself in the countries, um, in these areas, because you want to have this kind of global dominance. Um, and this is a new style of colonialism that may not look exactly like the British system, um, but let's be honest, it is still a form of control over those particular countries. Um, so yes, I, I firmly agree with this. Um, is there well, the African African nations should be free to ally themselves with whomever they want? Agreed. And uh, if uh, you know the world would be very different if uh, the U.S. and NATO nations got out of the way and let people figure out for themselves what 
what let me ask you this why do the countries agree so i i can understand um i know there's pressure that the united states puts on the various countries even in ecuador um just as something as basic as um they were making a determination on breast milk being the best thing and the united states was against this and was pressuring ecuador um to not sign on to that particular measure like it was some insane stuff where they were putting pressure on this like are you really putting pressure on this you know it, it's understood that way but they were doing it to some degree to benefit the um cereal companies right. who didn't want them to say that because you know it adversely affects their profits um so i understand that the u.s puts pressure on these various nations but like you made a point early on that, that only two nations in africa um does not have some kind of military agreement with the united states that is amazing i didn't i didn't know that yeah it's uh, these countries have been made vulnerable um the you know, col colonialism technically ended in the 60s as the uh, British and the French uh, gave, um, well, people struggled for independence. I, I don't want to say they were given independence. And they made the decision to uh, officially end colonialism, but there is financial control uh, over these countries, France in particular. Um, African countries, their currency, the, the former French colonies, their currency is controlled by France. Um, mm -hmm. They are uh, under tremendous pressure from uh, their formal, former uh, colonial uh, uh, overlords. And the US comes in with guns. Um, so for example, I, you know, it's a, we could talk about this, I have a segment just about Congo, for example. But the US gives millions of dollars to Uganda, to Rwanda, and they invaded Eastern Congo and killed 6 million people. Why? To get resources, to get uh, coltan in particular, a mineral that's used in electronics, yeah. um, everything that, that we use. So, um, so the, this is why African nations are vulnerable. And when leaders do emerge who want independence for their nations, they're, they're killed, um, they're undermined in a variety of ways. So Africa has been kept deliberately kept vulnerable by the U.S. and other NATO nations. So they accept these agreements um, because they, I believe, feel uh, feel powerless. So the United States comes in and says, "We're going to build a base. We're going to get jobs," as, as we just talked about. So there's an argument that this is, you know, this is a jobs program for people in country X. Um, and uh, without any other kind of support, there's a temptation to to yes, accept yes. it, especially when um, the uh, uh, leadership in these countries go along with it. And you don't have uh, uh, democratic nations where people have a voice, although I hasten to add, we don't have a democratic nation where people have a voice. So uh, when people at the top accept these uh, arrangements and these agreements, um, uh, people who may not want that don't really have a voice. And so it just continues this, this cycle of colonialism, continues this cycle of uh, enforced uh, dependency. Is there anything that I haven't asked that you would like to articulate before we end? Yes, I'd like to repeat, people should sign our petition, tinyurl.com slash shutdownafricom. And uh, in case I got that wrong, you can go to change.org and you can look, uh, search for AFRICOM and you can find the petition. You can also find it on the Black Alliance for Peace uh, website. I, I urge your viewers to take a look at our, our website and, and uh, find out how they can be involved. We are establishing groups in uh, cities uh, across the country. And we are really, we are looking for people. We know that there are people who want to be active, who uh, want to find new ways to impact uh, the political system. And uh, we, we are uh, an important part of that. So we look forward to our um, uh, um, request to the Congressional Black Caucus. And uh, it will be very interesting to see uh, how they respond uh, not just to us as an organization, but respond to the needs of their constituents. Their constituents need the United States to get out of Africa, need the United States to cut its military budget, and need them to take a leadership role 
in uh, carrying out uh, what will work best for their people. Are you optimistic that the Congressional Black Caucus is going to engage in this? I, I've become cynical of politics. Okay. And in becoming so cynical of the behavior of the people who are in the political space, um, I I am inclined to believe that 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 race is subordinate to class. Like so, um, the people having a particular racial identity doesn't necessarily correspond to what those people do. Um, and you know, making the point that the Republican Party, um, yes, is predominantly white, but those white people are being screwed over by the Republican Party. Like the fact that they're with the same race doesn't necessarily stop them from being um, indifferent to the plight of their own. I, I, I guess I feel that way about the Congressional Black Caucus also. Am, am, am I wrong to think that way? No, you're not wrong, but I, I think it's important to, and I, I never tell anybody they're wrong to be cynical. <laughs> Especially when you're talking about politics, you're more likely to be right if you're if you're being cynical. But I think we need to remember that um, uh, it's the movement from the bottom up. It's the movement, yeah. the demands of the masses of people that bring change to the country. And I, because you are right about uh, our political leadership, that tells us there's a need for the people to speak up and a need for us to make demands and engage with them. Because nothing nothing will change, definitely nothing will change if they don't hear from us. So this is this is something we, we have to do. And one last question, I'm sorry, I lied about it saying it was the last question before. It, it, sometimes these questions come up as I'm thinking about it. Um, when I was abroad, I was having a conversation with a woman from Kenya. And you know their living standard is far different than ours. It's a much poorer country, even though Nairobi looks like any city, any other city that you go to. Um, and in having this conversation, she's talking about her Americans and she says, you know, nothing changes because you guys are comfortable. Um, I, I don't necessarily think that's fully true in the sense of comfort. I, I look at other nations um, and from the standpoint of the standards of Europe, the United States almost looks like a third world country in some respects. You know, if you're talking about infrastructure, you're talking about um, um, wages. Even if you're talking about government services, things that the com community itself comes together and say, we want to provide X and to make sure that this relationship doesn't take place. France right now is flipping out. Mm -hmm. If the United States had anywhere near the social services of France, you know, it's, it's a mind building thing, the, the prospect. What is it? Is it comfort? Is it something else? What is it the thing that keeps the people in this country from being more vocal? Um, about things that should change. Like the war thing is a big deal. Like the amount of resources that it sucks into the country. And you have areas of the country that don't have clean water. You have people who are living on the streets. What is it that keeps this country from, let's say, exhibiting the behavior of France or the Yellow Vest movement, um, when in all honesty, it should be doing those things. Like Occupy Wall Street was a good example. Um, what am I missing? What's the thing? What's the thing? Because you're right. Nothing changes without push from below. Yeah, I think we, we can never forget that the liberation movement of the 60s and early 70s was crushed. It was deliberately crushed by uh, uh, the counterintelligence program, COINTELPRO, yeah. by uh, the assassination of King and uh, people uh, being literally killed off, being made political prisoners. So I think it's important to remember there was a war against these movements because they were successful. Um, so that's something that, uh, that we can uh, never forget. Uh, the explosion of the prison population was a way to kill off the movement. When uh, I, I wrote an article about uh, uh, King in the, earlier this year, the anniversary of his 50th anniversary of his assassination, when King was alive, there were only 300,000 people incarcerated in the entire country. There are now more than 2 million. It's oh, a wow. sevenfold increase. And that's how you destroy a movement. If you, uh, black people, if you put black people in jail, particularly uh, young men in, in prison, that destroys a number, it destroys people politically, financially, destroys family life. So we can't. Um, uh, underestimate the degree to which our movement was deliberately 
attacked and destroyed. Um, the uh, people in control, they're not stupid. So they see that people are protesting. They find ways to buy people off and they open the gates a little bit, let some people through. Um, uh, that uh, decreased the pressure, decreased the demands because um, uh, legal uh, uh, segregation ended and that did help some of us. It helped enough of us to take the pressure off. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, um, political process moved further and further and further to the right. And uh, the Democratic Party, which used to be the party of the people, the party um, that was in favor of equality and justice has moved further to the right along with it. So we have a far right party and a center right party yeah. controlling our politics. Um, uh, Occup the Occupy movement was very important. It showed it showed how much people want change. Yeah. Uh, they they took uh, Occupy out and this leaderless movement thing. I don't think that was a good idea. No, it wasn't. <laughs> it was not. So I think that was one of the things that uh, 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 helped it uh, uh, to disappear. Yeah. And you have people like, and, and as I say again, they're not stupid. They don't just sit around waiting to be destroyed. So they get somebody like Obama who puts a pretty face on imperialism and says the right things. Uh, and um, but he was the Wall Street candidate. Yeah. So he was the candidate of uh, people who claim to be on the left and the candidate of Goldman Sachs at the same time. So uh, I don't think we can underestimate the degree to which there's constant pressure on us not to do these things. And, uh, you know, and, and in general, Americans don't have a lot of class consciousness. So you see people struggling here who identify with the people who oppress them. That's peculiar yeah. American. Um, but uh, I think we can learn from people in, in other parts of the world. And France, people are protesting because France is becoming more like the United States. Yeah. Uh, Macron and some of his predecessors have little by little uh, whittled away at their social safety net, which was much stronger. They are a privatizing part of their health care system. The EU membership creates uh, incentives for businesses to relocate to lower wage EU countries like Poland, let's say. Yeah. So if a manufacturing entity moves to Poland, well, then that's a loss of uh, living wage jobs for people in France who used to have them. Um, but it's uh, we but we fight against this by moving to the left. There's so much talk about so much misuse of uh, words like fascism and socialism and you fight fascism very simply by taking care of people's needs. That's how you fight fascism. Um, uh, and true socialism, I, it's unfortunate that people who are just Democrats have been allowed to call themselves socialists. <laughs> talk about socialism, public ownership of the means of production. That's what we need to talk about. So Bernie Sanders is not a socialist. Ocasio-Cortez is not a socialist. They're just Democrats. And it's very unfortunate and dangerous for us to allow that word to be used uh, so in, incorrectly. But um, that's why we're here to talk about these things and encourage people to start speaking out. And they know that um, people want something different. And that's why, you know, uh, someone, uh, we were talking about Richard Wolf and how you got so many more views, because there are people who know the system doesn't work for them. Uh, so it's, it, but it's, it's, it's difficult in this country. We do have a, you know, we got a, a harder, a harder job, harder here. Path. but, uh, but anyway, we're, we're going to move on. Thank you. I appreciate it. And look, I, I think that what it's called revolutionary potential is there. I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily think the people who were part of Occupy Wall Street just vanished, you know, they, the leaderless thing is bizarre. Um, yeah. When you want to get something done, you need to figure it. I, I, you know, this, and I, I understand that they wanted to have this kind of decentralized structure and all of that. If you want to get something done, <laughs> there needs to be somebody who's there, whose sole job is it to get those things done. Yeah. Um, I think we talked about King. I think King was a good example of this. Um, yes, they wanted lefty stuff, but they also needed to know when they needed to fall in line in order to get those things accomplished. Yeah. And, um, and also, we need to we need to talk about these things. These 
we can learn from there's still people around from from those days in the 60s and 70s who can talk about their experience and tell us what we can do differently. And there's there's going to be struggle and debate. We can't be afraid of that. Yeah. Um, uh, in in order to uh, come up with um, with plans to move forward and know what actions to take next. Margaret Kimberly, thank you very much for coming on to the soapbox. Thank you so much for having me. Um, all the links are below um, if anyone wants to sign the petition um, and get more information about the essentially get America out of Africa and shut down Africa. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, guys, if you enjoy the content, please feel free to share, like, subscribe. You can always support the PayPal or Patreon. Thanks all.